Vetus has been a pioneer with electric drive since the 1980s. In this video we will dive deeper into the current range of e-drives, which are the e-line, an electric motor to replace a diesel engine with, and the revolutionary e-pod, which is fitted underneath the hull, you don't have a motor inside your boat anymore. We will also look at the fun of going fully electric, why it's so nice to have an electric drive, what it feels like in real life, and during the video we will install an e-drive, so that you can see what the options are for controls and monitoring. There are two main families in our e-drive systems, which is the e-line and the e-pod. Shown here is the e-line, which is an inline replacement for a two to four cylinder diesel engine. So it is to be fitted to a standard normal propeller shaft and we've specifically designed the motor mounts so that it can fit to basically any existing foundation for a two to four cylinder diesel engine. The position of the motor mounts of an e-line can be changed to almost any desired location. You can slide them forward and aft, in or out for narrower or wider engine berths. You can change the angle easily up to about 80 degrees for angled installations. And you can change the motor height up and down as you desire. It makes for a very flexible installation. The e-pod is a completely different solution. Most of the e-pod motor is fitted underneath the waterline. And if you look to the image on the left, the blue line is basically the bottom of the hull. And anything below the line is under the water level. And anything above the line is inside the hull. If you look at the picture on the right hand, on the lower part, you can see the white e-pod and a rudder blade. So this is all mounted underneath the water level. The top picture is uh, a boat with the companionway sole, basically the floor of the boat removed. And you're now looking at the top of the e-pod and that's all there is inside the boat. So it frees up a lot of room in the boat. You don't need an engine casing anymore. And many naval architects uh, really like this solution because it frees up a lot of room inside the hull. Both the e-line and the e-pod are controlled by the same panels. To the left we have the control panel for power. It's a normal lever going forward, neutral or in reverse. You can also start and stop the system with the buttons. And you have a power and eco setting. The power setting is nice for that additional bit of power when you're maneuvering. And with the eco setting you're certain to have a fun day out on the water without worrying about your battery range. On the right hand side top you can see the basic monitoring panel. It gives battery information full, halfway full or getting close to empty. And it also informs you if the system is powered up. Because the drive is so quiet, typically you don't notice it if you're still engaged in forward gear. So uh, it tells you if you're in gear or not. And it also gives you information on the health of the system. A key lock is shown on the bottom right hand side where you switch the full system on and off. The basic monitoring panels that we've just discussed are great for day boats since they will reassure the skipper that there's enough power available to go to their final destination. If you want to enjoy multiple days out on the water it makes sense to have additional battery information. To calculate that information a shunt must be installed and the shunt continuously measures how much energy is put into the battery bank when recharging or taken out of the battery bank when enjoying a day out on the water. That information is displayed on the screen shown on the right and here the screen is telling us that we're almost at full power, we're close slightly over 1400 rpm and at the current speed setting we still have 1 hour and 21 minutes of battery energy available. If we slow down a bit the system will immediately recalculate how much time is left. When recharging the numbers show us how long it will take for the batteries to be fully recharged. With this screen you also get a basic navigation screen, which is the screen on the left. At the moment it's telling us with the green circle how far we can still travel at the current speed setting. Once you've enjoyed a couple of days out on the water, your batteries will get close to empty and the circle will turn red to indicate that it is time to either slow down or to recharge the batteries. And as soon as you recharge the batteries, the circle becomes green again to indicate what the current range is at this speed and power setting. But why are electric drives suddenly so popular? Well, the incredible user friendliness is a big bonus. You hop onto your boat, unplug shore power and you go. 
no fuel to walk around with anymore, you don't have to do engine checks, you just hop in and you go. When maneuvering, an electric drive has a tremendous amount of power and it is there on an instant. A normal diesel engine, a normal gearbox takes a little bit of time to speed up and especially when going from forward to astern, you have to take a bit of time in neutral. With an electric drive you can go from full forward to full reverse as fast as you can uh, switch the lever over. So maneuvering is much easier. Now, another big bonus is that you will have a large battery bank on board for the comfort on board. Think of the refrigerator, cooling systems and on sailboats for instance for the autopilot, navigation lines, radar and navigation screens. And there are of course the environmental benefits. When you're using a boat there are no noxious gases that are sometimes blown into the boat. It's extremely quiet both inside and outside of the boat and there is no risk of fuel or oil contaminants that get into our beautiful waterways. When you decide to go electric you have to make an informed choice about the size of the battery bank and the size of the electric motor. Unfortunately we hear a lot of misunderstandings on replacing diesels with electric drives. Step one is decide how much power do you actually need to get your hull up to hull speed. And unfortunately, especially in Europe, we've gotten used to diesel engines that are way too large for the boat they're fitted to. With a diesel it doesn't matter that much, you just use a lot more diesel and your speed basically won't increase. Once you get up to hull speed, it takes a lot of energy to go a little bit faster because you're transferring all of that energy into waves. If you slow down just a little bit, your speed increases, well, close to nothing, but the power consumption dramatically drops. Now, unfortunately, a lot of information says you can replace a 40 horsepower diesel with a 10 kilowatt electric drive, but that's only true is that diesel was chosen too large. Now, the brochure shown on the left will give you a lot of information on your boat type, length, how much power you actually need to go fast. In the brochure it also has information on power supply, battery choices and charging options that you have. But first I would like to go more into how much power do you actually need. In the Vetus eDrive brochure you can find this table. Let's look at a 10 meter boat, 33 feet. How much power do you need for a given speed? Well, to move at a calm speed, which is 6 kilometers an hour, 3.3 knots, you only need 1 kilowatt of power. If you go a little bit faster, say 11.4 kilometers, slightly over 6 knots, power consumption goes up to 6.7 kilowatts, but you're going almost twice as fast. Now, at this moment, the boat will be at hull speed. If you want to throttle up even further, to go from 11.4 kilometers an hour to 14 or from 6 knots to 7.5 knots, power consumption doubles. So once you get close to hull speed, you're basically transforming energy into waves. It takes a lot of energy to go a little bit faster. Now this table will give you hints and ideas on what realistic speeds are and the amount of power needed and how long you can do, how far can you travel with a decently sized battery pack. These pictures basically have the same information as the table. In picture number one, we're at that calm speed, very little waves being formed. And you can see in the graph that speed is on the bottom, power is on the left hand side. With a little bit of power, you can travel at quite a decent speed. In picture number two, we've picked up a bit more speed. You can see a small wave forming at the bow. Uh, and it takes about twice the amount of energy to go twice as fast. So this is still uh, a nice cruising speed to travel at. But from here on, if you want to pick up more speed, the waves will start building. This boat is now close to the hull speed. You can see a big wave forming at the bow, a lot of wash at the back of the boat, a lot of energy is now changed into waves. And if you look at the graph, you can see that the speed increase from picture 2 to 3 is very small, but the power nearly doubles again. And of course you can see the banks of the river here, definitely not happy with these big waves. If you slow down just a little bit, speed decreases mildly, but your power consumption dramatically drops and you can have a lot, much longer day out on the water. At Vetus in Schiedam we have a couple of electric driven boats and it's always fun to take people out for their first time out on the water. 
Step one is always that they are surprised about the amount of power when maneuvering. You push the lever forward and the power is there instantly. Everyone is always surprised if you push the start button that basically nothing happens. The system boots up but there's no noise. And even when you put the control lever forward, there is no noise. You just feel the boat moving forward. Second step is that everybody wants to check full power. And of course, because the waves are so big, we always tell them to slow down a bit. And then you get a good sense of the range that you have during the trip. Another thing we always show people is the difference in GPS speed. How fast is the boat actually moving versus the feeling that you have. If you travel at a, at a low speed, below hull speed, you don't have much wave formation. There's very little noise from water rushing next to the boat. You think you're going slow, but you're actually moving at quite a nice speed. If you slow up a little bit, you can see the waves, you can hear the water murmuring around the boat. You have a feeling you're going fast, but basically you're just creating waves. And it's always interesting to see the difference in GPS speed and the feeling that people have. And of course, once we're back at the dock, you hook up the shore power and that's it. You've enjoyed the day out on the water. The installation of an e-drive is very straightforward. There are no exhaust hoses to be lugged around an engine, no water lock, no cooling lines. It's the engine, the control cables, our VCAN network, and of course the high power battery cables from battery towards the electric motor. Things to consider is where do you put the batteries and how do you charge them. But the charges are box standard, you just install them, hook them up to shore power and to the batteries. One thing you have to decide on is which controls to use. The basic controls are just plug and play, you hook them up to a VCAN network and they work. But for the advanced monitoring system with the additional VCAN screen, you need to install a shunt as well. The focal point of an installation should be how to transport the energy from the batteries to the electric drive. Keep those cables as short and thick as possible to minimize electric losses. If you don't have the tooling for those thick heavy gauge wires, any forklift shaft or battery supplier will make them for you on demand. The control cables use our proprietary VCAN network and it's literally plug and play. Hook it up with 12 volt, follow the schematics and the system will run. The cooling system, you have two main choices. The controller and the electric motor generate a little bit of warmth and that warmth, that energy needs to be dissipated. Now you can run salt water through the cooling system but if you run a lot in dirty water or you want a completely maintenance free system, you can use the keel cooling option. And basically we always advise it because it's completely maintenance free. To power the network you need a 12 volt converter, the battery supply 48 volts, so make sure that you have a 12 volt converter for the uh, comfort on board, but also to carry the VCAN network. If you want to use the advanced control system, so you want additional battery information, you have to fit the shunt and a basic NMEA 2000 network, which usually an NMEA 2000 network is on the boat anyway for your navigation and equipment. And again, those solutions are literally plug and play. Let's start building a Vetis A-Line system. This engine is already mounted on its engine mount and we're going to show you how to add the cabling to it. The plus 48 volt cables, but also the VCAN network for the ignition lock for the basic monitoring panel and of course the throttle. Then we're going to expand the system with a shunt which will give us much more detailed battery information and we're going to add our advanced monitoring system to it. It also has a basic navigation chart in there. We are not going to show you the boring parts of the installation. If you open the hood of the e-drive of course you have the plus and minus cables running towards the engine. So this is 48 volt minus 48 volt plus terminal going directly to the main switch which is of course connected to the 48 volt battery bank. In the middle is an additional cable. When we designed the e-drive the e -drive series, 48 volt chargers were difficult to find. So we've added an internal charger. If I put 24 volt on this cable, the e-drive will convert it into a charging profile for 48 volt. So including a bulk phase, a float phase. Uh, nowadays 48 volt chargers are easier to find. But if you can't find one, use the 24 volt cable. So in a normal installation you would probably only have 48 volt plus, 48 volt minus. Uh, and that's the high powered part of the engine. 
an e-drive system is supplied with a basic control system. It's of course the throttle with which you can start and stop the system, an ignition lock and a basic monitoring panel which will show you the health of the system and also a basic indication of the charge state of your batteries. All of these panels are connected with standard VCAN cables and if you follow the steps in the manual you will end up with a working system. To build the network for the control panels, the network has to end with a resistor, which I'm plugging into the electric motor now. From here we work with standard VCAN network cables, and one end of the cable goes into the electric motor, and the other end of the cable will go to the standard monitoring panel. The monitoring panel has two connections, so this is the one towards the electric motor, and the other cable I'm going to connect to the throttle control, to the power setting control. So this is the normal throttle control for forward, neutral, to switch on and off the system and the eco and power setting and it's now connected with the standard cables. The next step is the ignition switch, the key switch. The cables running to it might look impressive, but they're basically plus and minus 12 volt to power up the VCAN network. We've already spliced in an NMEA 2000 network power feed and this is plus and minus plus and negative towards the electric water pump and there's a VCAN connector. The VCAN connector goes into a hub and the hub has also has the terminating resistor to end the network and make sure you plug it in as far away from the ignition lock as possible so in the end where the ignition lock is not connected. This is the cable from the throttle control also into the hub. And this is all that's needed to hook up the basic system. Just feeding the wires through because I haven't attached 12 volt to the network yet. And the key switch which will power the network also powers the electric water pump, also powers the NMEA. 2000 network for all navigation equipment on board. Let's check if the system actually works by switching on the key switch. The first panel to respond will be the basic monitoring panel and it is now indicating that our batteries are fully charged with the green battery icon. If I apply power forward or in neutral, top left the green LED switches on to indicate that the propeller shaft is turning. The system is so quiet you might not notice otherwise. The other lights are for system health, things like overload or high temperature alarms. The advanced monitoring is also started up and it will indicate how much time we have when recharging the batteries before they are full or when boating, how long we have till the batteries are empty. You can also switch to a basic navigation screen. Because we're indoors, the GPS can't show us any information, but normally you would have a sailing chart here, a chart of your area. And with a circle, the system will indicate what your maximum range is at the current amount of speed, at the current power setting. Switching back to battery monitoring. And from here, we can put the lever forward and enjoy a nice day out on the water.